So I, I figured we've seen so many amazing talks today and it's just been so inspiring and I figured it'd be a good note to like, you know, end on an encouraging note and to end on like, okay, go and go and use all those things. So that's kind of the overarching mood of this talk. So for me, I run two businesses. I run a Binomial, which is my more well-known business. I've been doing that for, oh my God, over four years now, um, going on five years. And it's really successful. We partner with companies like, my dog needs to make an entrance into this talk. We partner with companies like Google, Activision, like big biomedical companies, like our image compression technology is widely used and we've started to get into the open source realm where we're setting new image standards with the goal being um, eventually all images in your browser will use our standardized technology um, that's now open source. So that's that thing. And then this past year, I also started an art business, um, kind of focusing on my more creative passions in that realm. But with, with both of these companies, I've kind of done it in a really unusual way, or at least unusual for the people I know. Um, I don't have employees. With Binomial, it's just me and one other person. We have no one else working with us regularly. And it just, a lot of stuff has gone down that's made our business very unusual. I don't work a lot. I deal with a lot of mental health stuff, so I don't work regularly or anything. It's just, it's been a very unusual way of operating. So, you know, I try to be that example for other people. And before that, I worked in uh, computer science. I worked as a full-time graphics programmer at companies like Oculus and Unity and uh, did low-level computing work for them. So because of all of the business experience I have, I, I've tried to help people out and help people start companies because I felt like I didn't have any role models when I was uh, starting Binomial especially. Um, so I would try to do these mentoring conversations and I've done probably hundreds of them. And at first I was like, okay, here's the list of advice I need to give people. And then I realized that every case was so different. And so it devolved into like, okay, let me ask the right questions and, and get that, you know, get prod at the right things and help them discover things. And then that wasn't even enough. And I realized that just validating and encouraging people was often the most helpful thing I could do. And I realized that every business is so unique. It's as unique as the people who are creating it because psychology is one of the major tenets behind business. The way you interact with customers, the way you sell things, the way you price things, the way you go about everything you do in business is unique to you and no one does it like you do. And so it's kind of like giving people um, regular relationship advice or advice on their friendships or even advice on their mental health. You can give them some kind of guidelines because people do have things in common, but at the same time, everyone is so unique. And I really like this psychology quote on that topic and I'll read it for the people who can't see the screen. I was listening to this like a podcast earlier, so. It says, our great teacher, Elvin Semrad, actively discouraged us from reading psychiatry textbooks in our first year. Semrad did not want our perceptions of reality to become obscured by the pseudo certainties of psychiatric diagnoses. I remember asking him once, what would you call this patient, schizophrenic or schizoaffective? And he paused and stroked his chin, apparently in deep thought, and said, I would call him Michael McIntyre. And I think about that a lot with business. People are like, do you have, you know, a bootstrap business? Okay, then you have to do it this way. Do you have to, do you get investors? Oh, you don't have employees. So, you know, you can't go down that path. Everybody's lifestyle is going to be different. So, you know, your lived experience uh, matters. And I'll talk a little bit more on that. So I do want to talk about my experiences, but I also want to um, kind of lead with just giving some general advice so that my experience doesn't look like a template for how to do things, because that's not 
what I'm trying to do. I want you to do things kind of your own way and start your business in your way and figure out what your way is. Kind of like figuring out anything about your identity. So I usually recommend um, being safe, but, but it's important to note that not everyone values safety <laughs> and people have different tolerances for risk. Some people are okay at the prospect of being homeless. I can't relate to that, but some people really, or some people have really great safety nets. So that's why they're okay with it. Um, other people are super conservative and like, will not do anything in life without a ton of like extra savings and safety. But it's a good idea. Um, and it's important to note that when I say I want you to pursue your business ideas, I'm not saying they're going to succeed. I'm just saying they can succeed. And I think a lot of people take it to extremes, like either I'm going to fail, I'm not going to sell anything, or all my stuff's going to sail so I can, I can just quit my job now, when usually it's, it's a gray area, it's somewhere in between. And that brings us to, like, I, I always recommend iterating, but not just iterating with ideas, iterating with sales, like start to sell something, like, a good example is the photography work I've done in the art business. I asked people, are you interested? Are you interested? Would you buy this? No one was interested. And I just put it on the store and it started selling. And it's, and on the converse level, in my um, experience with binomial, people kept saying they were interested in compression and in certain industries, there would be tons of interest, but no sales would come to it. They would even say like, we will buy this from you, but it never ended up selling. So I always encourage people to try to get as close as possible to selling. Like even things like market research only go so far. Like you, you know when the money is exchanging hands, if it's a good idea. I mean, if it's an idea that will be a viable business. And I also really recommend to talk to people. So I have a bunch of questions that I wrote down once because I've done so many of these informational in, in interviews, it's crazy. And basically, the idea with inter informational interviews is it's, it's kind of a way to give yourself a business education that's personalized to you. You can ask all these different people about their experiences with business. And a lot of people in the business community in particular are happy to share because this is how they learn to. Like I do tons of these uh, for other people as well. And you basically come and you ask them a list of questions and, um, and they answer that. And the idea is not to get a path for like success in business, but the idea is to kind of look at their life and and look at their decisions and see what you can take from that. You're not you're not going to be able to copy that, but you can kind of say, oh, I, I want that kind of lifestyle. And you can kind of start to see patterns emerging if you talk to enough people. If you talk to just one person or read like one book, um, you might not get the full picture for yourself. Um, and a big thing is that it also helps uh, you discover kind of what life you don't want to lead. Like maybe someone looks really successful, but when you talk to them, they, they, they're, they have a much more crowded life than you know you would be happy with, or they don't seem happy with their life. And you can kind of read between the lines a little bit and learn a little bit about what you don't want and what you do want. And one thing I see a lot, especially uh, with people who are underrepresented or um, just maybe even with mental health stuff, like people who are not neurotypical, like myself, like I cannot work a hundred hour week. And a lot of startup founders will be like, okay, so you're not gonna succeed. I, I, don't, I can't even work a 40 hour week. And a lot of people will be like, oh, so that means you can't succeed. And that's not necessarily true. Um, I think there's a lot of psychology at play when people discourage others that are trying to um, seek their advice. And I think, I think looking at that negative psychology can kind of give us some strength when we try to learn it from others. One is um, like crabs in a bucket mentality is when everyone is supportive of you when they feel like they're, you're on their level or you're below them. But as soon as you try to get out of the bucket 
and go what they perceive is more successful than them, they try to tear you down and they try to bring you down to their level. And I've seen that um, with like younger entrepreneurs who people will be so glad to mentor them, but then when they start to start selling things, they're like, no, 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 because I couldn't do that when I was 20, so I don't want you to do that, you know? Um, there's also like kind of responses to trauma that come up. I feel like whenever someone goes through trauma, they have a choice of saying, I went through that bad thing, so I don't want anyone else to go through it. Or they have a choice to say, I went through that bad thing, so nobody else should have to go through that. We see it in all kinds of minor traumas as well, like tech interviews that are idiotic and go really badly. People have the choice to be like, we're not doing it like that again. Or they have the choice to be like, I suffered, so everyone else should suffer and, and you know, take pride in that. So it's, it's important to identify those psychological things when you're talking to people. Which reminded me of kind of this quote in a psychology book by Dr. Emily Nagoski. She says, why is normal the goal? What do people really want when they want to be normal? I think that to feel normal is to feel that you belong. We want to know that we're safe within the bounds of shared human experience, that what's on our map is the same as what's on other people's maps. If we find ourselves in a place that we can't find on our map, that is, if we have an experience for which we have no frame of reference, no script, we feel lost. Unknown territory feels risky and it feels unsafe. But if someone comes along and says, you're okay, see, I've got this place here on my map, this is definitely part of the territory, we can relax. We know that we're still home, safe within bounds, we belong here. And I think about this a lot with entrepreneurship because entrepreneurship often looks like a route that is not modeled for us. You know, my lifestyle that I lead right now um, with not working a lot, with running multiple businesses, with not having a team, with no investors, no plans to scale, like that isn't really modeled a lot and that can therefore be deemed as unsafe. But it's just, it's not, it's just, it's just not normal. And I think getting comfortable with this mindset of finding belonging, even in tracks that not a lot of people follow, is really important. And everyone's values are unique, you know? Um, for instance, I have no desire to have employees and have a team at all, none. I, I don't wanna be a manager, I don't enjoy that, but other people, that's like why they start a business. They start a business to have a team. And it's really important to kind of identify what, what you personally value. I sometimes think of it like, like <laughs> this is a negative example, but thinking of like if an evil genie came along and like granted your wishes, but like found, like, you know, you could have a team, but then you'd be broke all the time. Do you still want a team? Like, it's important to think of those trade-offs because you run into it all the time. Like, thinking about what you really, like, if you could be famous but broke, would you be famous? You know, like, think about what you actually prioritize because those hard decisions often come up. The one I see a lot is people just really want a team at all costs and run their businesses into the ground because they just don't want to work alone. Um, um, or they really want investors or they want to grow fast and yeah so one thing I pay attention to is I personally pay attention a lot to free time and to the money coming in so those and free time matters a lot beyond the the money that's safe and then with with the art business I focus on making sure the art I'm creating makes me happy One thing that I see a lot is um, that people think that, you know, I'm not senior at my job yet, so I can't start a business. And I feel like this mentality <laughs> trickles up even when people get to be like directors in their company because, you know, you always feel like, oh, I'm not a CEO or I'm not, I'm not high enough yet. Um, but anyone can start a business. 
I, the way I see it is that a business is a, definitely a skill set, but it's not necessarily a skill set that's tied to technical ability at all. It's not even a skill set that's tied to having good product ideas. You know, we see this a lot of the time when we talk about like snaky salespeople, like <laughs> you, people can sell you anything if they're good enough at sales. And you could see that in a negative light as like uh, business people can be shady all people can be shady. Um, or you could see it as a positive light of like, oh my God, I can sell my things even if they are very basic to my technical peers. And that's one thing I've noticed with the art business is that my photography and my art is, you know, what other artists might consider basic if they've gone to school for eight years in art and things like that. But there's beautiful to people who buy them and that's all that matters is it doesn't need to be the epitome of of good art it just needs to accomplish its task and in tech that often looks like like the earlier today i just needed an app where i could have 10 people sign up and then it like all those slots be taken and calendly was way too complex google calendar had way too many features like i just needed that simple app and often a first year computer science student could build something like that. So, yeah. Now I'll talk a little bit about my experience. Do a time check. Okay, I'm all, I'm all right. I'm all right on time. So, first is my experience with Binomial. So, Binomial is my tech company. I started that when I was 26 years old. Um, I'm 30 now. I had like two or three years of three years of experience um, working as a programmer. I had no business experience and I had a computer science degree. Um, I also started it when I was in an abusive relationship and my life was a mess and um, my mental health was also a mess. And I basically started it because I realized that I didn't think I could get hired at tech jobs anymore. I, I thought, I would have to go back to working retail or something. And I made friends through networking with a very experienced programmer and we kind of partnered up. And I was so burnt out on tech that eventually I just started handling the people aspect and handling the business aspect. And we do big B2B sales. And so that means we sell to big corporations. And the beautiful thing about that is they move very slowly. <laughs> so it doesn't require like a lot of interactions. It just requires really strategic interactions. So, you know, we work with companies like Google, Activision, Magic Leap, which is a big VR company. Um, we also work on standards with companies like Microsoft, AMD. We, we basically like, yeah, we're, we're we're navigating that kind of industry um and because of the nature of those deals it's allowed me to to uh kind of have i don't know have have the life i have now and i'm happy to answer questions about that i also started an art business And lately I've been focused a lot on photography because it's been selling really well. But I also um, have used my electronics knowledge to make lights and stuff. And it kind of feeds a more um, humanistic, like direct connection with people. Like the stuff at Binomial is often very indirect. It's often very long-term. Like the standards work we're doing, I'm not gonna see results for that in 10 years. Um, and this is very, uh, very immediate. And when people buy stuff at Binomial, I kind of feel like they buy it because they should, because they need it. <laughs> and with when people buy my art, I feel like they buy it because they can relate to who I am. And that is very special to me. And so it kind of satisfies like th that human connection aspect of, of doing business. And I also sell art because I have a lot of business skills from being at the business helm of Binomial for so many years that I feel like I can use those business skills to make sure art has more value. I really believe that art is undervalued, that artists undervalue themselves, and that beauty makes life worth living, at least for me. And that should be a very valued thing to bring to someone's life, 
And so, um, and a lot of work goes into it. So I'm passionate about that. So, you know, not everyone has to sell what they make, but a lot of people want to. And selling what you make can get you a certain freedom and can, if you, if you structure it in the right way, can kind of allow you to live a happier life in a lifestyle that you want to live. It's not all about making money. It's about having more control over how you live your life. Um, so yeah, I, I always encourage people because of that iteration cycle to try to sell their ideas as soon as possible tomorrow and not to save tons of money, not to plan too far ahead. Just try to start selling something soon. If it's a complex product, maybe um, break it down and sell something else temporarily or do consulting or just, just start that cycle 